جی ویورز ہمارے ساتھ یہاں پر موجود ہیں ہمارے انگلینڈ کے جج ایک بڑے سینئر جج ہیں لارڈ کانوت وہ وہاں کی سپریم کورٹ میں ایک بطور جج اپنے فرائز انجام دے رہے ہیں لارڈ کانوت از ود آس اینڈ ویڈ لائک ٹو میک بیسٹ یوز آف دس اپرچونیٹی اینڈ آسک ایم اے فیو کوشچنس لارڈ کانوت دیر از اے ڈبیٹ گوئنگ آن ان پاکستان ایٹ دا مومنٹ اینڈ آل دا ڈپارٹمنٹ اسپیشلی دا انسٹیٹیوشنز ان پاکستان آر ان پروسیس آف ایولوشن اینڈ دیر از اے اسٹرانگ ڈبیٹ گوئنگ آن ود رسپیکٹ ٹو دا پارلیمنٹری سوبرانٹی پاکستان بینگ کانسٹیٹیوشن وچ ہیز ریٹن کانسٹیٹیوشن ان نیچر سو دیر از دس ٹگ آف وار گوئنگ آن بٹوین دا جوڈیشری دا پارلیمنٹ اینڈ دا لیجسلیچر ایز سم بڈی فرام اے کنٹری وچ ہیز ان ریٹن کانسٹیٹیوشن واٹ از یور ویو اباؤٹ پارلیمنٹری سپرامیسی اور سوبرانٹی اینڈ وی لائک ٹو ہیو بریفلی یور ویوز اباؤٹ Well, that's, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. That's a, a very big question. Um, in my country, we don't have a written constitution, but we have constitutional principles which are deeply ingrained in our legal culture, in our democratic culture, going back to the Civil War of the 17th century. And that was a really a battle between the king and parliament, and parliament emerged supreme. And so the great settlement at the end of the 17th century was really about the balance of power between the Crown and Parliament. But that settlement also ensured the independence of the judiciary. And so there's been this sort of balance between the three parts of government. Of course, now monarchy is reduced really just to a constitutional role. But as between the judges and Parliament, Parliament is undoubtedly sovereign. but the courts are there to ensure that Parliament stays within the bounds which it sets itself. And of course there are some unwritten principles which we apply to the interpretation of statutes which govern that. Um, but of course you contrast that with the United States where they have a written constitution in which the Supreme Court can strike down legislation as non-constitutional. And so they've had to work out that in their own way. but it's all about a balance and a respectful balance between the various organs of government. So, uh, my next question just, you know, it <coughs> emanates from your answer, is that there, is, there seems to be a differentiation between a written and an unwritten constitution. And Pakistan being a written constitution, you personally feel that in a written constitution, the Supreme Court has the power actually to strike down legislation if it sort of contravenes the fundamental rights, because that's been happening in Pakistan on quite a regular basis now. Well, I, I think we are probably the only or one of the only two countries in the world which doesn't have a written constitution. So the norm is to have a constitution, and where you have a written constitution, then generally the, the courts have power to strike down legislation which is unconstitutional, because that's their duty. But obviously that has to be treated with great respect and great caution, because they both, as I said before, the judiciary and the parliament must always respect each other's role. And over the last few years, we've seen internationally the concept of judicial activism is gradually seeping in. You see, even in your country recently, the Supreme Court passed, or the court in England passed a verdict on Brexit, where I believe you took a dissenting view as well. So here in Pakistan as well, that uh, concept is gradually seeping in. And we see the judges of the Supreme Court, judges of the High Court, because they're both vested with powers to strike down legislations and you know judicially review the administrative actions. So do you feel, uh, what, what exactly do you feel about judicial activism and you know is there any boundary to that or is there a plausible explanation that can be rendered in case it goes to an extreme? Well I'd start by challenging the view that judicial activism if that's the right word is new. If you go back to Lord Mansfield in the 19th century who more or less developed the commercial law single-handedly. If you go to the judges of the Chancery Division in during the Industrial Revolution who actually intervene to ensure that polluting industries were brought within bounds. Judges were just as active as they are now, possibly more so. And of course, if you look back during my lifetime, Lord Denning was one of the most active judges you could imagine. So I don't think there's anything new, but I don't particularly like the term activism because what judges are trying to do is to apply and interpret the law and to do so in a way which is sympathetic to the needs of society. And I hope that will always be the governing approach.
And now moving on to this conference, precisely what brings you to Pakistan, uh, I wanted to ask you that what exactly do you feel about this colloquium and this conference which has been hosted here? And our ex-Punjab Chief Justice Sayyid Mansur Ali Shah, he's, he's played a pivotal role in developing law with respect to climate change and environment in particular. So what are your views about Justice Mansur Ali Shah and Justice Jawad Al Hassan, who's presently looking after the environment bench? Well, I, I must say I was very pleased to be invited to this conference. I've been to a number of conferences on environmental matters in the Asian region, and I think the work of the Asian Development Bank has been very important. I've met a Judge Mansour Ali Shah at several of those matters. He's come to a conference I organized in London on climate change and the law three years ago, um, and I've been delighted to see his, his approach. And um, I think it's very timely because, as this conference shows, the, the issues of climate change and the way we tackle them are among the most urgent issues facing society. And so to have judges who really understand the issues, like him, and building on the work of Dr. Hassan, um, Pakistan is obviously taking a primary role, and I'm delighted to see it. And I'll now pass on my mic to Mr. Abu Zar Salman. He wants to ask you a few questions. First of all, sir, welcome to Pakistan. Uh, it's a great honor that you're in Pakistan and we will learn from your uh, experience and everything. I have a question for you. Uh, as you can see in, uh, see, in Pakistan, the superior judiciary has interpreted the right to life, the fundamental right article, in a way that it has included uh, the right to have a healthy environment. It's a fundamental right. It has just uh, included in the ambit of right to life this and uh, the concept of uh, a healthy environment do you think the lawmakers need to think about it in pakistan and pass a constitutional amendment and amend the article 9 or uh, introduce a new article uh, just like article 9a by just incorporating right to a healthy environment in the right to life uh, article well it, it really isn't for me to advise pakistan how to deal with those sort of issues um, but I certainly have been very impressed as I visited countries around the world to see how the different constitutions have um, incorporated environmental principles so that either they, the more recent ones have in expressed environmental protections, the ones which go a bit further back like Pakistan don't, but the judges have been able to find the principles there and find it in the Philippines as well, where they've been very strong. Clearly, um, one should have the right to a healthy environment as a basic idea. I mean, the, we were talking about the Supreme, the judge in the opposer case who said that it really goes back, before, the idea goes back before constitutions were invented. It's something innate, and I think that's something which we all understand, but how each jurisdiction gives effect to that, I think is very much a matter for that jurisdiction. Can I just ask one more question and then we have to tip it off. Now we bring you down to the beautiful city of Lahore and you know as the saying goes in Punjabi that somebody who's not seen Lahore is yet to be born. Yeah. So what are your views about Lahore in particular and, and generally the hospitality here the, of the judges in particular and you know people that you've met well, I'm delighted that I've now visited Lahore, and so I've been born, if I hadn't before. <laughs> um, I certainly, I've heard a lot about Lahore, so I'm very pleased to have the chance to come here. I was very pleased to have the chance to see some of the sites yesterday, and, um, well, the welcome has just been tremendous. We've had wonderful hospitality from everyone, so I'm very, very grateful. But I think one of the striking things that's come out of this conference is how Pakistan um, and Lahore played such an important role in the development of environmental law and that's been a very important factor and a very good reason for having the conference here. Thank you very much and we would also like to mention that one of our leading law journals, the Supreme Court Monthly Review, is very very fond of you and we keep printing you in our sure. journals. Pakistan Law Digest is very fond of you and we're very happy to have you here and we expect to see you soon in Pakistan again, probably every year so that we can make best <laughs> use of that. Thank you very much for being with Thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.